Welcome back to Scousers with a Passion. Um, thank you so, so much for your support uh, for the first few episodes. I am really excited about this series uh, because, as you know, I absolutely love Liverpool uh, and I consider myself an adopted Scouser. So today we are here with Mike. Mike is the owner uh, and the director of my gym, <laughs> the, the gym I go to, a Steel Habitat. I discovered Steel about a year and a half ago and it truly changed my life um, in so many ways. Uh, but I will let Mike uh, t take on and tell you all about himself and the gym. Over to you. All right. Um, yeah, so we opened Steel like seven years ago. It was back in 2013. Before that, I played a reasonably like high level of rugby, I played professional and semi-professional for a few years. I um, actually lived in Hong Kong for a little while. And when we came back, I was a, was a university lecturer around like sports coaching and sports science and that kind of thing. And I hated doing it. Um, we got to the end of we got to the end of the year. I had like two hundred papers to mark, and I remember we went through marking all the papers, and we got to um, like an invigilator kind of process where another university and college like remarks your papers, yeah. and it turned out that like the process that we'd been following had been completely wrong. So we oh no <laughs> yeah so. <laughs> <but> <laughs> the, the prospect of doing that all again, I was just like uh, I'm not. I'm not down for this at all. So it was kind of then that I sort of took the initial leap to open a gym. And that was mainly just born out of my own passion for like strength and conditioning, lifting weights and all of that kind of stuff. Because, uh, you know, that was the part of sport that I enjoyed the most. I've done sports science at university and I just really wanted to have my own gym. So it was more initially like out of the, well, it'd be cool to have my own place to train. Um, it's a big jump though, yeah, going yeah. from something like an academic career to actually being an entrepreneur, isn't it? So it was a big, uh, was it a, a change in mindset or was it just that you took the academic job because this is what was available? Yeah, the, the academic job was kind of a, a lucky uh, connection when I came back from Hong Kong. So we returned uh, from there, I think it was like December 2012. And the, you know, without turning it into a typical, like, uh, woe is me story, but we came back and we had like no money, no jobs, I moved back in with my parents <laughs> and all, all that kind of stuff just to get back going. I was really lucky to be able to get like a, through people that I knew before I'd left, um, yeah. like, job lecturing and stuff like that. But I just didn't enjoy it. I've never really enjoyed like working for somebody and I've always had a bit of when I look back I've always had a bit of like an entrepreneurial kind of spirit, spirit. yeah yeah, yeah. So like a, like a, a side story for that just things like um I was really into like magic when I was younger like when I was like 12 oh, I love that. so I used to so like <laughs> even then I was like I got into that and then I started making magic tricks and selling them on eBay like remaking stuff and selling them and then just things like that, like when England won the Rugby World Cup, we there used to be this thing a good few years ago where people would make uh, like 10 and 20 pound notes, but instead of the Queen's head, it was like a footballer or a rugby player. <laughs> so I remember sitting at home, like scanning these 10 pound notes and then using like uh, Microsoft Paint to like put a rugby player's face on it instead and then printing them out and selling them at the local rugby club just after England had won the World Cup with like Johnny Wilkinson's face on and stuff like that. <laughs> I love that. I've always, always done stuff like that. So I think it, it felt like a natural thing for me to, you know, have something of my own that I wanted to do. And it was just kind of uh, a passion for strength training and lifting weights yeah. and all that kind of stuff that made it uh, the obvious choice at that point. And it was a small leap in terms of the uncertainty of it, but we only took on a really small unit. I mean, obviously, you know, the gym that we have now is a reasonable size, yeah. but it was it was 600 square foot which is about half of the smallest unit that we've got at the moment yeah. so it was a tiny starting point and I think we started it off with just like three or four grand's worth of money that I borrowed off my my dad and we just bought yeah. second-hand equipment from eBay and all that kind of stuff um, and then kind of quickly realized after we got it open that oh, I need to learn like how to run a business and market and sell and <laughs> 
I that was a surprise, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. I was like, I, there's only so there's only so many friends that I can get to join the gym before I need to start like generating clients that aren't people who are already connected to me. So um, yeah, then I've kind of really dived into that side of things. And my personality is that I'm, like obsessive about things that I'm interested in, driven to to complete. That was kind of what took me through my my rugby career to one point and then when I got into business then it's the same kind of thing and I'm still on that journey with it now so I think that is a bit of um, a common de denominator though through uh, across uh, entrepreneurs isn't it because we like a lot of people start businesses and then they just as you say there comes a point where there is only so many friends and so many family members you can get, you know, you yeah. can convince into buying your stuff, whether, <laughs> whether it's products or services or, you know, and then it runs out and there is where you can see who is the entrepreneur, isn't it? Because there is where entrepreneurs will actually go, I'll find a way now. Yeah. Yeah. And other people just go, I'll find a job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh that's it and uh you know there's nothing there's nothing wrong with like having a job or working for oh, somebody God, no. i just i just always known knew that for me that wasn't something that i wanted to do like every time i don't take instruction from other people very well it's probably one of my <laughs> my things when i was younger uh like looking back at it there's definitely like a you know an inflated sense of self-confidence there that made me kind of like no no if you don't want to do it that way we'll do it my way kind of thing yeah. whilst that probably served me well um it didn't serve me well when i was like working for yeah it never does week. when you're in school does it <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. So, um yeah so like so you know it's been a long journey from that point to where we are now like the, yeah so how things. did it evolve you started the small gym let's call, let's call it the small gym yeah. um and then what happened you you kind of started looking into how could you become a better business person and, and how did it grow? How did it start and how did it get to the point where we are now? Because for those who have never been to steel <laughs> <laughs> at the moment, um, we are in a business unit and we've got three different units um, and we train across all the units at the moment, very COVID safely. Each one of us has got our little square um, and we don't get out of our square. <laughs> but uh, in general, when the pandemic wasn't here, we could mix. Um, but yeah, it's a very big gym for the kind of gym it is. Um, I mean, I had been, I had tried... Um, weight training before and I tried uh oh my god I can't think of the of the word what's crossfit? the name yes <laughs> crossfit <laughs> and it's usually really small environments it's never such a big such a big place so how did you get to make a difference yeah I think um early on my, my the thing that I enjoyed uh, when I was playing sport was like obviously the weightlifting side of things but also like the a couple of things that we still do at Steel now, which is the, the like team kind of group environment where you're training alongside other people. But then there's also elements of the the programming and the coaching being like customized to you specifically and like yeah. your goals. So a lot of gyms uh, similar to ours will either do you know maybe a circuit class or a boot camp where everyone's doing the same thing, or maybe they opt for personal training where it's really one-to-one -one close quarters kind of stuff. And I wanted to make, a, you know, realize reasonably early on that we wanted to make like a hybrid of those two things where you had all the benefits of the group training and the atmosphere and the support and all of that kind of thing in the session. But then also the customization of like working on a program that's specific to your goal and having the support and accountability from a personal coach and all that yeah. kind of side of it. And then on, on like a financial side, we worked out, you know, the model of how we run things yeah. works pretty well in the square footage that we have of like a 1500 square foot unit between sort of 12 and 16 people training in a session. And yeah. then at numerous points when we've been expanding, we've looked at like, oh, do we, do we try and offer a different service? Do we add this in? Do we add that? And do we change different things? But like you've seen at Steel now, we've basically got just three uh, duplicates of each other because we've like filled one of the units up 
and then yeah. like right the demand is still there we're still able to generate you know yeah potential clients so then we've just duplicated what we've already succeeded with and what we're already um you know happy yeah. with the service we deliver and just keep like tweaking and improving that and then yeah it, and i think that th this model is what made such a difference um uh, during the pandemic also the the fact that we were all alone we were all in our houses and, and yeah. i was losing my mind i don't know about anyone else but <laughs> i was losing my mind i've got four cats and a kid and um i and and my partner is um is is a, a key worker so he was working as if nothing ever happened he was leaving the house going out coming back it was like life as usual um but for me i i go out and see my clients and i come to the gym and i go to hot yoga and i go for walks i was seriously losing my mind and the community that the 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 sense of support that we got from steel is something i never got from any other gym and that was only possible because it was there before not because you suddenly went <laughs> all right there's the pandemic what are we going to do we're, we're now going to create a community the community was there and it was created by the fact that we train together but there is always a, a trainer assigned to us who knows the inside and outs of, of us and why we train and what do we want to achieve. So I think this is absolutely brilliant. Um, and my second question is always why Liverpool? Why didn't you go anywhere else? Uh, somewhere that is like, uh, I don't know, in Italy, I would say, why didn't you go to Milan? Because it's the <laughs> yeah. place where business happen. Or uh, I suppose in the UK, you'd say London. Um, when people have business ideas, they kind of tend to move towards the place where the business happens yeah. um, and Liverpool is not exactly famous for that although <laughs> I think it's full of amazing entrepreneurs yeah. uh, and this is why I'm doing this series to prove to the world <laughs> that Liverpool is full of amazing entrepreneurs so why Liverpool why didn't you go anywhere else I mean the first thing is uh, I was born and bred here like I, I might not sound exactly like that I have a very strong Scouse accent in comparison to some other people but I've lived the you know the very large majority of my life in Liverpool and I can't ever really imagine not having a permanent home here even if I you know I have been away for certain periods of time and stuff like that like it's a great city and increasingly so uh, it's very supportive um, you know especially on the client side of independent businesses I feel like that's a real yeah. strong point of of Liverpool for sure and you only have to look at like the food and drink kind of seeing to see that yeah and, it's absolutely and, brilliant isn't it yeah like yeah. It, it's a it's outstanding and um you know even on the health and fitness side like obviously you know we're trying to make a success of our gym and there are other you know really high quality facilities around that are doing either similar stuff or you know stuff in the same kind of industry as us and it just made i mean initially it made sense because i was here i wanted to open a business close to home it just made sense without us moving yeah. but like uh, absolutely like ha super happy that we made that decision because I think it's a great place to be and like you only have to look at like steel for example to see um, the support that we have uh, from our clients and stuff like that and all of our members like people are on board with uh, if people are doing good things it doesn't matter whether you're a big business or small business you know you'll get supported here so yeah, yeah I mean, it is uh, it is a place like that and this is one of the reasons i i really love liverpool people always say oh you, you work in marketing and business strategy you shouldn't be there you should be you know somewhere else where bigger things happen you could have bigger clients but i wouldn't swap this place for the world i moved no, here 10 true. years ago and i wouldn't go anywhere else yeah i think it's an increasingly um growing thing for uh I mean, obviously we notice it because we're in Liverpool ourselves and I'm sure it's similar in other places, but it's increasingly, you know, there are small independent businesses getting started and people are working for those and supporting those and doing things differently outside of like the more typical, yeah. um, you know, I don't know if you call it like corporate jobs, but outside of that. And like I said, they're, you know, very well supported, like places like the Baltic market and that whole area is supported really well by the people like in the city. Yeah. And, 
obviously it's, to- it's totally reliant on the product or service. Like, you know, you have to yeah. be d- delivering something better or different or both to, you know, what the, the typical kind of competition is from bigger businesses. But if you do that, um, you know, people get on board with what you're doing. So. Absolutely. Yes, <laughs> I agree. Um, so we're getting towards the end of the interview. We're bang on on time. I really like that. Uh, and um, we always end on a positive note, an inspirational quote, a motto you live by, a phrase you find particularly inspiring. So which one is it for you? <laughs> I mean, it, it, it could be a lot of things. I'm not necessarily like a big kind of quotes guy, but my kind of ethos around things is, um, especially around businesses, um, just keep working on stuff and make constant iterations. Like something that I've found over the years is the, the more like things you try, the more versions of things that you try and put out, the quicker you're going to make mistakes, the quicker you're going to improve and the quicker the business is going to grow and get better. So, I mean if we went back through all of the different versions of steel and all of the things we've tried for every function within the business from sales and marketing and customer experience and all of that kind of stuff, like it's almost unrecognizable from the beginning because we just, we're not afraid to keep trying stuff. And then if we try something and it doesn't work, we're happy to like bin it, change direction and just keep moving forwards. I think if you can keep working on stuff, that's going to make it much, much easier. I mean, I'm probably, you know, obsessive over work to a point where people maybe shouldn't follow my lead on that side of things. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think, you know, going through a process of constant reiteration around everything and asking questions, like asking constant questions, even if things are going well, it's like, how could we do this better? Or if we couldn't do it this way, what would we do instead? And seeing if you come up with, you know, better answers. So like taking some kind of thinking time to ask questions around things and see if you can come up with better versions. And at very least, you you know, especially as you get later into running the business, you're going to um, almost just confirm that the way you are doing certain things is right because you can't necessarily yeah. think of a better way or think of a, a different way to do it. But also... Yeah, you'll have absolutely. Time, yeah. yeah. But, and also you'll have times where you realize that, oh, we could actually do this better. We could actually do this in a different way that is more efficient or delivers a better service. And I think, um, you know, people will stagnate either in the beginning or later on by the lack of taking the time to think more deeply about things and ask like better questions of themselves around yeah. their business and then make those reiterations afterwards. So that's kind of like my ethos. Like I said, I just I incessantly work. So, you know, you know, I like that. I really like that. <laughs> and I agree. Um, I'm constantly changing and changing and changing, getting what people tell me and changing the way I work. So I understand. And I really, really like it. And I think the world is evolving outside. And even if we're successful today, it doesn't necessarily mean that we should stick to this forever. Um, everyone, everyone evolves. So yeah, that's it. And it's important to continue to do that. Like, listen to your clients, listen to your customers. And and that doesn't necessarily mean listen to specific individual pieces of feedback, but overall, what is the general kind of consensus around things? What, what do people like? What do people, where are you lacking in certain things and see if you can plug those holes and make things better because while this is a good kind of quote that I always like is, I can't remember who said it, but it's something along the lines of like, whilst the customer isn't always right necessarily, they are the best source of information that you have about what your clients currently like, don't like, need or don't need. Yeah. So use that to um, give you that feedback and then use that information to make decisions on you know, how things improve or how you improve things moving forward. So. I love that. So <laughs> if people want to come check Steel out, where do, you, do they find you online, offline, et cetera, et cetera? Mm-hmm. Where do they get more information, et cetera? All right. So, I mean, the easiest way is just to go to steelhabitat.co.uk. That's our, our website. Um, and then obviously we're on, on Instagram at Steel Habitat Gym, on Facebook, Steel Habitat as well. So all really simple ones to find. Um, you just find, have to remember, Steel Habitat. <laughs> that's it, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a re- reasonably unique name as well, so you're not going to get stuck trying to find us. Um, and then, no. 
yeah, everything you need like to know if you ever want to look into what we do or get started, that's all included in those places. So. Fabulous. Listen, thank you so, so much. It's been a pleasure talking to you and uh, thank you. Just that. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> I will speak to you soon. No worries, Fran. Thank you. Bye.